The National Park in American Samoa is the last national park where the sun sets. If you were to go across the earth, across America, it's a spot of great beauty. And it's one of the most unique parks in that the Park Service doesn't own the land. They have leases for the land for 50 years. Because in Samoa, the land is owned by all the people and they will not sell the land to anybody who is not Native Samoan. And so the land is co-run by the Samoan people and the Park Service. The place where the sun sets last on an American park. A place of great beauty and wonder. A place of great friendliness. In Samoa, among some of the villages, there is a tradition called Sa, in which at six o'clock at night, the, well, the first bell rings at five to six, telling people that they need to get back home and in their houses. The second bell rings at six, inviting them in their houses to a time of prayer and reflection upon God's work. And then the third bell chimes, allowing them to go back to their daily lives. They have an order and rhythm. A bell that rings some of the year in the spring and fall at sunset. Our idea today is ending. American Samoa is at the end, if you are heading west, of all the American parts. Moses, today in our story, is at the end. In the part of the scripture that I read to you, it tells us that Moses is right at the point at which he is going to climb one more mountain for the very last time. And he has just told some of the last words he has about the law to the Israelites. And then God says to him, you can climb this mountain, but you're never going to enter the promised land because of what happened at sin. So what happened? that place that doesn't let Moses enter the promised land. It's an open question that the rabbis do not have a good answer for. Because what this text says of that story is that the people have wandered for 40 years, because we're now in Deuteronomy, we're no longer in Exodus, right? So they've wandered for 40 years, learned what it meant to be a people who live under the promises and covenant of his God. And they get to the point where they're on the border. They're almost to the promised land. And they're at a spot where there is no water. So what do you all know about water and the traveling Israelites? That God provides, right? That God will make sure that they have water. Well, they're a stiff-necked people, right? A grumbling lot. And so they complain about not having water. And God and Moses have a discussion. And God tells Moses to take his staff and tell them, speak to them, that God will bring forth water. So Moses thinks, this is like the last time he got them water. Remember that story we read where he pounds his staff and the water bursts out of the rock. So he comes up to the staff, tells them they're a grumbling, unthankful people, smacks the rock twice and the water comes out. So from our position, having read the whole story, we go, why is Moses being punished for giving the people water? Right? Because that's what he did in the previous story. Half the rock, water came. So one of the explanations of the punishment is that God told him to speak, not to strike. In the first instance, when they had 
just started out on their journey, he told them to strike. So what's the difference there? Moses not trusting God, not believing God's word, not following God's actions. But that explanation leaves us flat, and I'll tell you why. Because we know from that story that God forgives the people, right? God forgives the people every time they do something horrible because it's after that point of grumbling about water and food that they create an idol and God forgives them. So if God forgives the people and is allowing the people into the promised land, why wouldn't God forgive Moses? Why wouldn't God let Moses into the promised land? The one of all the people who always believed God, who always trusted in his promises, who shared his word with the people, who saw God face to face. Why would God not let Moses into the promised land? It is a contentious debate among Christian pastors and rabbis. Because the answer is not clear. It says it this time. But what it says is that God is punishing Moses because of the people. That God is not letting Moses into the promised land because of what the people did. Which also is not a comfortable explanation. So what do we do with this? Why can't Moses, at the end of his life, enter the promised land? Why can't he cross over the Jordan River and experience the promise that God has made for generation and generation and generation? Why? So in our story today, the part which I read, that conversation happens between God and Moses. And quickly thereafter, Aaron dies on a mountain. Miriam, their sister, had already died on a previous mountain. And Moses tells each of the people of Israel, the tribe, describes them. He sings a song of the tribe and who they are and what they can be and what their fatal flaw is. And then they get to his mountain. His mountain, which he climbs to the top of. And when he gets to the top of the mountain, it says, did you know Moses was 80 years old when he set out on his 40-year journey? 80 years old. Because it says, at the top of the mountain, he's 120 years old and has great vision and stamina as he's at the top of the mountain. And what happens at the top of the mountain is that God shows him the promised land. God takes him from east to west, showing him everything that the Israelites will be living with. Shows him the beauty of that land, the land flowing with milk and honey. God shows him what the people will experience. And then Moses dies. And there's a tender scene here because God is the one who buries Moses. God is the one who takes care of Moses' body and makes sure it rests eternally. God is the one who cares for Moses as he dies and is dead. And then the scripture ends. The chapter 34 ends. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel, like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And while it's a beautiful ending, and on that very last chapter, it does not 
say that God won't let Moses into the promised land. It doesn't blame him for the inability to go. But we're still left with that question. Why there? Why at the precipice of fulfilling all the dreams and visions? Why? One of the arguments is that Moses had a particular job for a particular time and space. And as Rabbi Tarkin says, it is not for you to complete the task, but neither are you free to disengage from it. Moses' task, Moses' job, was to free the Israelites from bondage, from slavery, from captivity, and to help mold them into a free people. So maybe one of the problems with the stick striking the rock was that when he struck the rock the first time, the Israelites understood what that meant because they were a people in bondage. They knew that sticks and striking were what the slave owners did to them. But now, 40 years later, with many of those people who had been captive dead, with a new generation around, they needed a different answer. They needed words spoken. They needed to be convinced of the truth of the argument. They needed words, not a violent act, because they were a different people, a free people. So Moses had the task of creating this free people. But it wasn't his job to take the next action, to do the next action, to take them to the next point. That was a job for a different person, a person we will learn about next week. For Moses, this is the moment where his task is done. And it isn't complete, and he is probably very disappointed because his dreams are unfulfilled. Moses is in that now, but not yet time. On the border of the promised land, but what is to be will be completed by other people. Moses' task is done. And a new leader has to arrive. I want you to think about this liturgically. For the Jewish people, this is the end of their year. The last Torah that is read is that phrase that I gave you, never since has arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, who the Lord knew face to face. The Torah ends there, and they begin the cycle again yearly. They go from Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy. That's their liturgical cycle. And so Moses dies, and they begin again in Genesis. They never liturgically enter the promised land. What does that do for you as a people, knowing that you will never be the people that cross over into the promised land, that make it to the other side of the Jordan River? What does that create in you as a people? How many of us have dreams and tasks that seem us that are unfinished, that aren't complete. Maybe the story says to us that sometimes it isn't our job to complete the task. Sometimes it's our job to teach about the vision, to teach about the promised land, but we are not invited to enter. Because you know yesterday, was the day that Martin Luther King Jr. shared that dream. The dream of entering a promised land that he was never to enter. But he shared with everybody that there was a time, there was a place where everyone could be free, where everyone would be a 
beloved child of God where everyone would belong. But not yet. Now we are on the border of the promised land. What dreams do we have that are unfulfilled? What steps do we need to take that we need to teach the next generation, the next group of people, so that they can enter the promised land? What dream do we need to teach so they can see what is possible? As the sun sets there, as the ending comes, what we experience is a God who cared so much about Moses that he buried him himself. A God who cared so much about this people that the promised land is there. The river is there to be crossed. That the Jordan will lead them to a new world. And when you're in American Samoa looking out at the horizon, it's that promise and potential and wonder that is just out there exposed and wide open that you can see more than you have ever seen before. You can see forever, and yet you can't quite touch it. That's the promise of Moses' story. Promised land is there, that we can do our part to take the next step to reach the promised land and cross the Jordan. 